After the horrors of last night, I tried to get at least some rest in the early morning hours, but I just lied awake. Around 10 o'clock, when the sun was already high in the sky, Dale came knocking on my door. He greeted me with a forced smile, obviously trying to appear confident. He looked like he himself had not gotten a wink of sleep either. Are you ready, Leah? He asked softly. I swallowed and bit my lip. I don't want to do this, Dale, I confessed. Yeah, I know, Leah, Dale muttered. I remember thinking that something was off about him, as if he was in the midst of quarreling or struggling with himself. The frown on his face looked deeply conflicted. Ever since I arrived here, I found it hard to trust anyone in this house. I mean, as far as I know, it's like Bridget said, they could most certainly sell me out. I'm not even sure if it was smart to even trust her. Then again, while trying to kill Warren was not successful by any means, I am glad that I did it. For one very short moment, I was completely certain that he was dead, and those were some of the happiest few seconds in my life. I still hope Dale would remain honest with me though. Up to that point, he had not really given me any indication that he wouldn't. I straightened up and got out of bed. Dale then nodded at me and held open the door. I grabbed the revolver and fixed the locket around my neck. He's in the kitchen, Leah, Dale uttered. I followed him downstairs. My heart was pounding in my chest, and my stomach felt uncomfortably tight, almost as if I was drunk on nervousness. Bridget, Dean, Rick, and Betty were all standing in the living room. The red-haired woman shot me an apologetic glance. Watch what you say, Leah, she whispered as I passed. And be careful, please, she said. I nodded and proceeded to lean around the corner to peer into the kitchen. There was Mitchell, sitting at the table, with a plate and a glass of milk in front of him. Why does he look like Mitchell, I thought. He had the same broad frame, the same dark brown hair, and the same large face. A terrible thought then crossed my mind. It took every ounce of strength that I had to swallow my apprehension and set foot into the small room. The second that I entered the room, Non Mitchell's head jerked around and his eyes were fixated on me. I quickly glanced back to Dale, who was standing right behind me. He then made a half-hearted attempt at a reassuring smile. I bit my lip once again and stepped forward. Non Mitchell did not budge when I approached him. He just remained seated, waiting for me to pull out a chair and sit down across from him. For a few seconds, I held my breath, not daring to break his gaze, not daring to say a word. I watched as he took the piece of bread that was on his plate and slowly tore a piece off of it. He then dropped the smaller piece and continued to half in the remaining part, all the while gazing at me with narrowed eyes. I opened my mouth to say something, but nothing but a low calling sound came out. I was almost relieved when he finally spoke up, in that awful unnatural voice of his, making me shudder just a little. Do you happen to be cold, Leah? He asked. My lips were unable to form any words at that point. Not even a short no left my mouth. Instead, I lowered my gaze and shook my head. Are you certain, dear? You can tell me if you're cold, Leah, he said. I'm not, I breathed. A sardonic smile then crossed his lips. That is very strange. I could have sworn that I saw you tremble just now, he commented. Then another long pause followed. Warren grabbed one of the bread pieces and slowly brought it up to his mouth, 
letting it vanish behind his row of black teeth. I realized that I had never actually seen him take in any food before. He immediately picked up another piece and carefully tore it in half. Is Mitchell all right? I managed to say, my breath extremely shaking. Die can take on forms of those who are alive just as easy as those who are deceased, he said. Is Mitchell all right? I asked again. Warren then looked up from his plate. He is, he answered. I swallowed hard. I would like it much better if you weren't using his form, I said sharply. Non Mitchell then raised his eyebrows. Slowly, his face began to contort. His jaw cracked as his mouth stretched, almost all the way up to his ears, baring his ashen teeth. Saliva instantly began to run down his chin. His eyes grew smaller and smaller, as well as narrow, until they were nothing but thin menacing slits. His fingers started to stretch, growing longer and slimmer. His nails growing pointy and sharp, until they resembled claws more than hands. The dark hair that I knew so well, of my co-worker and friend, took on a ghostly white color. His skin had become so pale and ashen that I was certain I could see the veins pulsating underneath. Once again, his clothing slackened as it adapted to his lean, starved body. I think I can by now fathom his appearance a little clearer. He looked sort of like, like those modern artworks depicting skinwalkers, just more, more human, but by no means any less predatory. I took a deep breath, trying my best not to seem frightened. It was almost impossible, though. I felt my hair stand more on end with every passing second that I held his gaze. Are you mad at me? I finally managed to press out. Warren then shook his head. It is not your fault that you attacked me. You were coerced into doing it after all. You are delightfully trusting. It is endearing, really. But you have to stop listening to dumb people. It's too bad that that trait has never acted in your favor before, he replied. The way he spoke made me shiver. Every word that he said was drawn out, slow and deliberate. Is there anything you wanted to tell me, or... I began to say. Warren then shot me a thin smile. There is. I would like to know just what you are doing here. You do not belong here, Leah. Not with these greedy, gullible, and treacherous people. They are just waiting to throw you, how you say, under the bus, you know? He said. I gulped reaching to grab at my locket. I placed the revolver on my lap, its weight reassuringly pressing down on my thigh. Stop being so immature, Warren told me. Take that locket off, won't you? He said. I don't want to, I replied, wrapping my fingers around it even tighter. Why would I believe you of all people? I added. No. I'll admit, I was not always up front with my intentions towards you. Still, I do believe to be the lesser evil here, he replied. Yeah, I don't think so, Warren, I hissed. I wasn't even sure what he meant by that, to be honest, but I didn't want to listen to him either. What a shame, he said. He regarded me with an unreadable expression. Maybe it was just his twisted face that made it come off that way. You should still listen to what I have to say, Leah, he remarked. I averted my eyes, nodding for him to go ahead. Die fancy a wager with you, he said. I couldn't help but immediately look up at him, 
growing attentive at these words. I believe I overheard you promise a certain doe-eyed man that you would free him from his misery. I want you to know that that is nothing you can do on your own. But I, I most certainly can, he said smiling. He then picked up another piece of bread and nibbled on its crust. Black goo then began soaking into the dough. And at what price? I inquired. Oh, Leah, you sound more apprehensive than I expected. Maybe I should negotiate over Nathan's life with someone who, well, cares just a little bit more, he commented. I do care. I do. I just want to know what... My voice then trailed off as I followed Warren's gaze to the doorway. I turned to see Dale peeking in at us with a frown. Now, now, Dale, this is no time to be shy. Come on in, join us, and tell her the truth for once, Warren said in a way too cheerful tone, cracking me a Sandrin smile. My former manager then trotted inside the kitchen. He looked over at me with extremely sad eyes, as if begging for forgiveness. I'm sorry, Leah, he muttered, his voice cracking as he did. I don't... What's going on? I stammered, my gaze darting between the smirkish Warren and the sheepish Dale. What's going on is that he said he wanted to help you, right? No, I'm sure that that was true in the beginning, or at least until he realized what there was to win back. I overstepped a couple boundaries, my mistake, even though I could hardly say that I regret it. Still, there was no real reason to drive you all the way out here, now was there? Do you want to know what I think, Leah? I think Dale heard the ones underground cursing you out, so he fired you, unsure of what might happen to you. Soon after, however, he realized that he had lost a valuable bargaining chip. As an employee of the park, he had a certain authority over you, but he fired you. The only way to regain some authority would be to make you his and his family's guest. It was stupid to lure me over to a place where the family's young ones are, but at this point we both know that Dale acts before he thinks, Warren said. I then turned to face Dale. Is that true? I said, my voice loud and obnoxious. Dale then bit his lip. I'm so sorry, Leah. I swear, this whole time, I wasn't sure if I could go through with it or not. I never wanted to. I swear. I just... I... He then stopped speaking and ran his fingers through his hair, pure desperation written all over his face. There is your trustworthy friend, Leah, Warren said. I spun around once again only to behold Nathan's soft, handsome features. His chin was resting on his fist as he smiled up at Dale with twinkling brown eyes. I felt sick at the sound of the wild one's cold metallic voice coming from my friend's mouth. Stop that! Dale uttered. Don't do that! He added, more furiously this time. Non Nathan then let out an eerie cackle finally baring his black teeth. Warren then began to turn back to his true self, still laughing as he did. Suddenly, I spotted something in the back of his throat. I watched in horror as two thin black insect legs emerged from within his mouth. Another two pairs soon followed as slowly and deliberately a large cockroach pulled itself out from his lips, crawled all the way up his face, 
and vanished into his white hair. As his cackles grew louder and louder, two more bugs scurried out from amidst his mouth, only to disappear on his head. I felt like gagging. So, are you willing to listen to my proposal? Or do I have to enlist your pathetic acquaintance's help? Warren asked. Go ahead, I muttered. I will release Nathan from the stagecoach if you make it back to him in the span of two days, he said courtly. You have to be on time, Leah. Also, I will most certainly join in on the fun. Think of it as a, a larger version of the game tag. I will grant you a head start of, well, let's say ten hours, maybe. I am a gentleman after all. If you do not make it back to him in time, or I manage to find and catch you before you have reached him, you lose, he said. I then swallowed. What happens if I lose, though? I asked. Well, I am so very glad that you asked. You see, if you lose, I want you to get rid of that awful necklace of yours and that revolver as well. No more silver, no more iron, no more laurel, sage, or red verbena, he told me. I then frowned. That would render me completely powerless, I thought. Still, there was something incredibly tempting about his offer. Two days. I can make it in two days, right? I can try my luck with hitchhiking. It shouldn't be that hard, I thought. I still have a few more questions, though, I interjected. Well, ask away, my dear Leah, Warren offered, plucking apart his bread once again. Why me? I asked. Because chasing Dale around would not be any fun whatsoever, he replied. No, I mean, why me, of all people in the park? Why are you so, so focused on me? I asked. Warren did not respond. He just smiled dryly and shoved another piece of bread into his mouth. That's when I noticed something. Three cockroaches had crept out of his mouth. There were three bullet holes in his chest, and there were three wild ones in the park. Swallowing my apprehension, I repeated my question once again. And again, I received no reply. I asked again, and Warren shot me a displeased look, yet opening his mouth and answered, You stayed in the park on your own accord, Leah. Nobody ever forced you, and I am sure you were not in a beggar's position. Admit it, you found it exciting. You must have felt it too. I know you did, he answered. Um, so did the others. What's your point? I inquired. Warren then leaned forward a bit. My point is, I really, really like you. The others are all right, mostly, but I like you most of all, he said. The way he said that made me shiver for a third time. The answer was elusive, and I can't claim that I really understood it, but it felt so, so wrong. I didn't actually want to know more, but I just had to ask. What happened when you were alone in the restroom with me? I asked. Again, there was no response. He merely sat and stared at his plate. I did the same as earlier and repeated the question twice. I wish I hadn't. You were unconscious, Leah. I took your backpack and poured what was in it on the floor. Then I collected the things that I could touch without getting hurt, that is, and put them back inside. Then I opened your mouth. It was quite difficult, since you were unconscious. But, he began to say, That's enough! I yelled, interrupting him. I don't want to hear any more. 
At least that confirmed my suspicions, though. Why is it that the other non-actors hate Laurel, too? I asked. Because it is the one thing that hurts the most, he replied. Another elusive response. Admittedly, this one was a bit more useful. Have you made up your mind yet, Leah? Warren inquired. I could sense that his patience was wearing thin. Instead of asking what the number three meant to him, I just nodded. Yeah, there's one more thing, though. You're expecting me to play only for Nathan's release, but if I lose, I have to let go of every single thing that protects me. So, if I win, I want my humanity back as well. I want you to stop whatever weird shit you've started doing to my body. Is that clear? I said. Warren then chuckled. Certainly. I thought that was just common sense, he replied. Don't give me that crap. You wanted to screw me over, I said as I got up from my seat. I'm not wasting any time here. I'm getting my stuff, and then we're getting started, I said. I shot Dale, who had been standing quietly in the corner of the kitchen up to that point, a short and bored glance. He looked back at me with tear-filled eyes. I merely shook my head and went upstairs to grab my belongings. When I had gathered everything, including the locket and the revolver, of course, I passed Dale's family, who were once again gathered in the kitchen. Warren was still sitting at the table, watching me with what I assumed was amusement. The wager is on, then, I told him firmly, hiding my sweaty palms in my pockets. I will see you soon, Leah, he said in a menacing, tranquil tone. Fuck you! I hissed, marching out the back door. It was high noon when I left. I had first made my way out of the neighborhood that Dale's family lived in. I wandered alongside the road for a little while. I stopped near the edge of the woods that lie adjacent to the road and pulled out my cell phone to check my position. There had to be some way that I could get back to the park. I figured I would just need to find the right route. Suddenly, I felt a tug on my shirt. I looked down and almost jumped in shock when I laid eyes on her. Right next to me stood a little girl. She was barefoot and in a simple light pink dress. If it hadn't been for her head, being that of a rabbit's, but still the size of a child's, I would have never thought there was anything off about her. Hello, the rabbit-headed girl greeted me. It took a little while for me to calm down from my initial shock. Um, hi, I uttered, my mouth still agape. You're the one that they're all looking for, she said. Where are you going? Um, I need to, um, I have to get back to the park. I... My voice then trailed off, losing itself in incoherent stammerings. I can help you. I know a shortcut, she said, clutching my fingers with her tiny hand. I was suspicious at first, very much so in fact. That was until she explained that she harbored a deep resentment toward the wild ones. Especially Warren. I followed him here, you know. He's a dingus, she said. I chuckled a bit and figured, what the hell? Maybe this is another instance of me being too naive. But right now, we are sitting in the woods, taking a break from walking. She says it'll be okay, though, because once we reach the shortcut, we'll be at the park in no time. I have yet to ask why she hates Warren so much, but I think I can trust her. It feels right somehow. Plus, in the short time that we have spent together so far, the little cutie hasn't once asked me what my name was. I think that's a good sign. I can't believe I'm actually doing this.